it's unspeakably cruel. And in this, I want to tell you a story about one of my heroes, a man named Craig Watts. And he may seem like an unlikely hero to you because he was a chicken farmer in North Carolina. And um, Craig had been raising chickens for about 20 plus years on his farm. He was in the Purdue system, which meant that Purdue provided him chicks and gave him all the gear to use in his operation. He followed the rules. They gave him a rule book for how to raise the chickens. They give him the feed. And then he'd sell back the meat at the end and they'd, you know, he'd make a little bit to pay his, to, to hopefully pay down some of his debt. After 20 plus years, he was still in debt to Purdue from the original operation set up, but he was eating away at it slowly. He was not making a lot of money, but this was his profession. Now, Craig had to do some stuff he didn't especially like. In fact, it was pretty horrendous. So here's the deal. It was a broiler farm. It means they were being raised for meat. 20,000 birds in one warehouse. Picture this. Concrete floors. No windows. In fact, if there were any, it was any natural light, it would cause the birds to move more, which would reduce the feed conversion ratio. And it was actually in his contract that he was never allowed to open a window because that would create more, more activity in the flock. Now, the birds were standing in fecal material, not just their own, but the fecal material of generations of birds before them. They would clean out the floors every few years. They were bred to be morbidly obese, which means that it was the equivalent to if a human infant by the age of three months weighed about 600 pounds. They were so heavy that they couldn't walk later in their lives. They were given about one square foot per bird, which means they couldn't really even lift a wing. The stocking density was so intense. And because they couldn't walk properly because they were so overweight, they would lie in manure and they would lose feathers, develop sores. About 5% of the birds would be dead by the time it came time to harvest, aka kill the flock. So there's dead bodies lying around on the floor. There's open wounds all over the place. Birds are standing in fecal material. They can't even spread a wing. And this is their life. Craig didn't love it, but he was trying to make ends meet and take care of his family. Then one day he sees an ad on television. Jim Perdue is saying, at Perdue Farms, we treat our chickens right. They're happy and they're healthy. And Craig saw this and he said, I'm not a psychologist, but I can tell you our birds are not happy. I'm not a vet, but I can tell you our birds are not healthy. And if I don't do something about this, then I'm complicit in a lie. And I may be a lot of things, but I'm not a liar. So Craig decided to invite Compassion in World Farming to come on in with cameras rolling and take video footage of his award-winning Purdue farm. And by the way, he was being inspected by Purdue every week and he'd been winning awards for his production quotas and his operation being an exemplary one. So they came in and filmed. This wasn't some case of an undercover investigation of a bad apple, so to speak. This was a farmer showing exactly what was happening in a typical operation. And he filmed it and he talked about what was going on and how the birds were treated and what they were feeling and ended up becoming a news story. Craig Watts's video went, nas went viral and was on national television. And Purdue was not pleased, as you might imagine. They ended up punishing him and making him do these trainings. They tried to make it sound like he was a bad apple who just wasn't following the rules. But in fact, he was following the rules perfectly. This is how they told everyone to do it in their contracts. Anyway, the amazing part of the story is that it, it broke the story, it exposed a lot of what was going on. And Craig, a little while later, said, I'm getting out of the chicken business. He didn't know what he was going to do, but he started growing row crops on his land, getting rid of all the chicken farm materials. And then he started working as a consultant, helping factory farmers transition. 
to more ethical and sustainable livelihoods. Can you imagine how much courage it took for Craig Watts to bring those cameras in? His conscience was bigger than even his need for security, even maybe the survival of his family. That's a lot of integrity. And you might not expect that from a chicken farmer in North Carolina, but sometimes integrity wins. Sometimes love wins. My grandpa Irv, you wouldn't have expected him to give up ice cream. He manufactured and sold more ice cream than any human being who's ever lived. But he wanted to live and he made big changes. And you know something, he was one stubborn cookie. If he could change his diet, if he could give up ice cream, then maybe there's hope for the rest of us too. So here's the thing, folks. What we're up against can seem daunting. It can seem overwhelming. But we also come from an unbroken chain of human beings who lived long enough to reproduce, often against great odds. In fact, for many of our ancestors, the majority of humans did not make it. Maybe they'd have 10 kids starting super young and maybe two or three of them would make it long enough to reproduce. The odds were stacked against us in so many generations of human history. But our ancestors all made it to that point. That's a lot of odds against us. The odds against any one of us being here right now are infinitesimally small. Thousands of generations of survivors. And we have that in our DNA. So I believe that as we become learners, as we become aware of our condition on this planet and of the cost of the status quo, I believe that we have the potential now, every single one of us, to be a part of discovery and healing and transformation. Just like Craig Watts took his place in the change. Just like my grandpa, of all things, took his place in the change. Each of us has some part we can play, some role we can fill, some contribution we can make to be a part of the solution on this planet. And I think this is an extraordinary time to be alive. I think we have an incredible opportunity to make a difference. And I think that is such a blessed and beautiful thing. Now, a lot of people talk with me and say, Ocean, okay, I'm inspired. I want to do something. I already do eat better than most folks, but how do you talk to other people? How do you convince them? Because here's the thing. We need to lead by example, right? We want to inspire others, though. We don't just need to do it for ourselves. There's a saying, put your own oxygen mask on first before helping others. They always say that when you're boarding an airplane, right? Well, we've got to deal with ourselves, right? We've got to take care of ourselves, self-accountability, walk the talk, live the message, right? In all the ways that we can. But then we're also social creatures who are impacted by everyone else's choices. So of course we want to influence them too. So if you're in a place where you're like, okay, I'm inspired. I want to do something. What can I do? How do I influence others? Well, let's talk about that a little bit now, okay? So one of the things that I've learned is number one, lead by example, right? You absolutely have to walk the talk and live it for reals. And the most contagious thing is when people say, wow, you look so good. What's your secret? Or, wow, you, you lost a lot of weight since I saw you last. How'd you do it? Or, you know, your skin's so clean. What's, this, what's the trick? You know, is it some beauty product? Or did you get, a fa did you get work done? Or and you're like, no, I eat healthy food. And I smile, you know, or I exercise, right? Like if you're fit, if you're alive, if you're vital, that is the best way to be a messenger of what's possible, okay? That's number one. Number two is be willing to talk to people. Not like a proselytizing a-hole, but like a passionate human who loves them. So, you know, if, if we just keep it to ourselves, we'll never create change but we've got to do it respectfully and consciously and look for openings. Notice where people are engaged, what they care about, and relate it to that. Dr. Neil Barnard gave me this trick. He said, if you give somebody a book or a video, which is a great resource, by the way, giving somebody access to a film or a book that's moved you, 
or a talk, one of the presentations here even that's moved you can be a wonderful way to stimulate them and inspire them. You don't have to be the messenger to give them the message. But you can also like put a post-it note on there or put a cover note on there that says, hey, I thought of you on page 73. Or I thought of you when I watched, you know, right around the uh, a third of the way through this film, there's a section where they talk about X and it really made me think of you. If there's something that lands that's specific to them, that can be super powerful. Or we put on a food revolution summit where we have an ep we just had an episode on each of eight major topics in the food movement. And so maybe you, if you get the empowerment package from that, you send people like one of the episodes, right? So you know, whatever the resources are, maybe if they're elderly and they're thinking about chronic disease, you give them forks over knives. Maybe if they're younger and they're thinking about peak fitness, you give them game changers. There's so many great movies and resources out there. Um, find the ones that seem relevant and share them, okay? Um, number three, love people no matter what. You know, um, it's so powerful and so important to not make your love conditional on what people eat. Um, and they feel that. Because here's the thing, if, if you create a condition, especially with family, where they feel like, you know, you're going to think you're going to lose respect for them if they don't change, then it's some part of them says, oh my gosh, my sovereignty depends on not doing what this person wants. Because a lot of us get in power struggles, right? And a lot of us, let's be honest, we want to be right. And we want to be righter than our spouse or our, our kids or even our parents. We want to be the righteous one who wins in the power struggle. Well, here's the thing. If that's the game, you're probably going to lose. If winning is defined by beating them and conforming them to your wishes and your will, and that's what the game is about, you're probably going to lose. If winning is them getting the results they want, them feeling good in their bodies, them having their goals met, whatever those goals are, having pleasure, having vitality, having dignity, having joy, if those are your goals for them, then you focus on that. You focus on the big why, the big outcome that you have in common, which is an awesome life maybe, for example, which is them feeling good. If you join them in that and food becomes a tool to help them get what they want in life, then you're on their side. And they may not agree with you, but at least it's an opportunity for them to feel your love and your support. Now, I want to tell you a little story from my own life. My dad was a great teacher for me around unconditional love. When I was um, five years old, we moved off the little island where I was born in the middle of the woods to suburban Victoria, British Columbia, so that I could go to school and be around other kids. And um, I started around the age of six, started going to birthday parties with my friends, and there was birthday cake. And uh, my mom and dad didn't want me eating that cake, and I understood why. So they would make me, you know, these sort of uh, vegan whole wheat flour carob cake that I would take with me. They'd make me a little container. It was very sweet of them. So I'd have something else to eat that was just for me while all my friends were eating the cake they were all excited about. And for a while, that was all good with me. But one day, curiosity got the better of me. And I was like, I've got to taste that and, you know, see what it's like. So, so I took a bite, um, ended up having a whole slice of cake. And then I was like, oh my God, what is my dad going to say? Um, but we valued honesty in our family and it took me about a week to summon up the courage to talk about it. But about a week later, I, I said, hey, you know something? Um, I've got something I've got to tell you that I'm a little bit scared to say. My dad said, Ocean, thank you. I love that you want to tell me everything, even what's scary. I will always value honesty in our relationship and I'll never be angry with you for telling me the truth. What is it? And I said, well, you know how I went to uh, Damien's birthday party last weekend? He's like, yes. And I was like, well, they had cake there. And I was like, it, it, it. And um, he's like, yeah, I'm sure they did. And I was like, and um, well, here's the thing. Um, I had a bite and he's like, okay, thanks for telling me. And I was like, well, there's more. He's like, what? And I said, actually, I had a whole slice. <laughs> and my dad says, Ocean, thanks so much for telling me. I'm so grateful that you can tell me the truth. And then I was like, well, there's more. He said, what? And I said, it tasted really good. And then, and then my dad was like, Ocean, I'm sure it did. I've eaten more sugar 
more cakes and more ice cream than you could probably even imagine in my life. And I know how good it can taste. And then, you know, he said, and I want you to know, I'll never be angry with you for telling me the truth. Thank you so much for telling me. And I love you no matter what you eat. And then we started talking and we came, he told me a little more again about blood sugar and, you know, how the products in that cake affect the human body. And then um, we made this deal. We said, how about if he said, you're a kid, you can, you can have a perspective on what happens at these events that no adult can get to have. So why don't you kind of be an undercover investigator? And next time you're at birthday party, see what you notice about what happens to the kids when they eat the cake. So I started noticing that kids were playing happily at parties and then the cake would come out and afterwards they get in a lot of fights. And, you know, I, I started to get this, this perspective that basically cake equals misery. I was a bit of a James Bond fan at the time. And I found the idea of being an under, undercover investigator, fascinating and exciting. And I would report back to my dad about this. And so, you know, over time, I decided that occasionally I decided I had to eat some cake because I had to be one of the people and not, not, not ruin my, my, uh, my cover, you know, but other times uh, I would not because I wanted to stay sober so I could have an objective analysis of the situation. And I took my job quite seriously. Um, I think that what I want to share about this little story is how grateful I am to my dad for his unconditional love. I'm grateful that he told me the truth about food and its impact. And I'm grateful that he told me he valued truth from me more than performance. And I'm grateful that he told me he would love me no matter what I ate. And I think that all of our loved ones need that from us. They need the truth in whatever form we can deliver it. They need our respect for their truth, genuinely and for reals, no matter what that is. And they need our unconditional love. And what I want to suggest too is that we need our unconditional love as well. You know, we've got a lot of messages in our society about how we're supposed to look, about what an ideal body is. And compared to those images, almost everybody is too short or too tall or too fat or too thin or too brown or too white or too something. And all of these messages have a cruelty in them. Even our greatest supermodels torture themselves, feeling like they don't measure up, freaking out about every blemish. There is no perfect. There's just perfectly you. And each of us needs to come to terms with that and learn to love our bodies and love ourselves just the way we are. So to me, the goal of healthy eating isn't to guarantee we'll never suffer. It isn't to look like the greatest supermodel. It's to do the best we can with the life we've got to create the optimal conditions for wellness, vitality, and joy. And we'll get more of that when we love ourselves unconditionally, even our desires for things that maybe aren't good for us. We love that place and we integrate that place instead of fighting it, shaming it, blaming it. And then over time, perhaps we can become more whole and more capable of making truly integrated and wise choices. You know, many people struggle with food addiction. Maybe you can relate. If you ever find yourself on the wrong end of an empty bag of cookies or chips, saying, why the heck did I do that? What was I thinking? But we were, we, were, we were overwhelmed with the desire. If you ever find yourself obsessing about food, you may be dealing with some addiction. If so, you're not alone. In fact, it's normal in our modern society. And food researchers now recognize, psychologists now recognize food addiction is absolutely real. I say it impacts us a lot more than most of us realize. It's shades of gray. Some people are completely overwhelmed and they're binging constantly, but a lot of us are pulled consistently towards foods that are not in our best interests. And that pull can be stronger or weaker depending on a variety of circumstances. The thing is, when you succumb to that pull, it gets stronger because you get more hooked and the pathways get deeper in the brain. The dopamine hits that come with those foods get stronger and you start to feel worse. And guess what? When you feel worse, you need short-term pleasure more. A brain that is able to think long-term 
tends to make long-term choices and to feel better. A brain that is in crisis and fear and reaction and stress tends to react in ways that respond to momentary fleeting pleasure. So if you want to create the conditions for long-term vitality and wellness, then it really serves you to get off that treadmill. And one of the best ways you get off that treadmill is step-by-step leaning into healthy choices and coming up with positive alternatives. You want to clear out the bad stuff. You want to clear the bad stuff out of your fridge and you want to start having options. So if you find yourself snacking late at night, then you know what? Maybe you want to snack on celery and carrot sticks with a bit of hummus or some peanut butter. Maybe you want to snack on some apples, you know, sliced fruit, some frozen berries. Think about the things you can have on hand that, you, that, that are good for you. You can snack to your heart's content on kale. I'm serious. Eat as much as you want. You will be fine. You know, I mean, this is good stuff. So, so the thing is to repattern so that we start to crave the things that love us back. That's the, that's the art of shifting. And for some people, this is easy. They just decide to make a change and they do it. For other people, it's really, really, really hard. The key thing is that you can't make it all about willpower. It's got to be about habit. It's what you do when you're down and when you're tired and when you're stressed and when you're, when you're at your wit's end that's going to shape your destiny more often than not. So creating the conditions where you've got safety nets, where you've got resources and options can help you to make the best possible choices at those times. And you're going to slip sometimes, almost for sure, in some way, whatever a slip is to you. Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn says, Every so often he has a piece of dark chocolate. To him, that's slipping. I would not necessarily agree, but to him, that is. And you know what? Like we've all got our spots, right? So love yourself and then keep leaning into possibility and positivity and making the best choices you can because your life and your planet will be the better for it. What you eat has a profound impact on your life. And when you create positive momentum, you create positive feedback loops. When you eat foods that are vital and give you more energy, then you exercise more. You feel lighter on your feet, which makes you move more, which makes you feel better, which makes you be gravitating towards the healthier foods that are better for you. When we're feeling better, we tend to do better. We tend to make better choices and the feedback loops get positive and you get reinforcement and you love your life more. And then you want to preserve your life more and you're less likely to make short-term reactive impulse decisions. We're less likely to ask, what do I want now? And more likely to ask, what do I want most? And those choices start to shift and our perspective starts to change and it gets easier and easier. You know, the best time to repair a roof is when the sun is shining, not when it's pouring rain. The best time to make habit change isn't when you're stressed and distressed, exhausted and fatigued. It's usually when you have a little bit of space. So on the weekend or when you have some free, a few, few hours open, that's when you do your shopping for the week. That's when you do your menu planning. That's when you cook your legumes and your grains so you have them in the fridge ready to pop out so you've got ready to go meals. That's when you make a big pot of soup with all the leftover veggies in the fridge and then freeze extras so you've got them during the week when you're stressed. Planning ahead, cooking in quantity, these are critical components to helping you create the conditions for success. Now, another word about the social piece. I'm going to get personal here with a, another story from my own life. So I'm a dad. I've got kids that are twins, River and Bodhi. They're on the autism spectrum. They were born nine weeks prematurely. And they didn't talk for a very long time. They didn't walk for a very long time. We didn't know if they ever would until they did. They're doing so well. They're awesomely autistic. They're, they're so courageous and they have to work a lot harder for some things than a lot of us do. But they're joyous. They love to dance. They have huge hearts. They love the food revolution. We talk about food all the time. And um, uh, But there was a point uh, when they were about 10 years old when River and I had never made eye contact never just had the experience of looking in each other's eyes and feeling each other. And I thought we never would. And then my partner and I discovered a program called Sunrise, S-O-N-R-I-S-E, which focuses on a relationship-centered approach to autism. Instead of trying to drag kids out into our world, the idea was we would join them in their world 
make connection. The, the theory goes that autistic folks tend to behave with cyclical and repetitive patterns because they don't know how to filter in the way that a neurotypical brain does. So they're overwhelmed with sensory input. And so they're trying to get some sense of security and repetition gives them that. It's not that they are um, dumb. In fact, they're hyper intelligent and they get hyper saturated. So they're trying to find some peace. So they'll say the same things, do the same things over and over often to try to get some peace in the world. So the idea is that you join them in their behaviors and their experiences rather than trying to stop it. Instead of training behavior change, you connect with them. So it's all about eye contact and relationship building. And so one day I was doing that with River. He's, well, here's what's going on. So he's chewing on a Barbie doll's foot, which is something he did a lot at that time. He would just sit there and chew on the foot, seemingly oblivious to the world. So I picked up another Barbie. And instead of dragging his Barbie out of his mouth and where, you know, my gosh, this thing's probably made in China. Where's the, what, what toxins are leaching into his body from the plastic? And how's my kid ever going to have a dating life if he chews on Barbie feet all day long? I decided to join him. So I sit across the room and I'm chewing on a Barbie foot. And suddenly he looks at me. And this huge smile comes over his face. And I could almost hear him thinking, oh my God, there is intelligent life on this planet. So now River is beaming at me. And we're looking in each other's eyes and I'm chewing on a Barbie fit. And suddenly that foot tastes amazing. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so beautiful. I'm looking in my kid's eyes for the first time in my life. And then River gestures like this. Turns out his Barbie has two feet. He's inviting me to come chew on the other foot of his Barbie. So now I come over and we're like three inches apart. And we're beaming in each other's eyes and there's tears rolling down my face. And we're chewing on Barbie feet together. And it was one of the happiest days of my life. So do you know why I'm telling you this story? Am I advocating for a new form of parenting when you chew on Barbie feet? Well, not necessarily. I'm telling you this story because it has profound relevance to our ability to influence others. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, you have no moral authority with those who can feel your underlying contempt. When we judge people, when we pathologize people, we lose moral standing in the relationship. How often have we blamed people or judged people for behaviors we did not understand and lost moral standing? They could feel the contempt. They could feel the disrespect. And they didn't like it. And we lost connection with them. So if there's anybody in your life that does things you don't like, you don't have to accept the behavior, of course, if they're behaving violently or disrespectfully. But can you find a place where you get curious why they do what they do? What's in it for them? How does it in some way, however twisted it may be, make sense to them? Maybe feel like the best they know how to do with whatever complexities or challenges they face, whatever traumas they may have endured. It doesn't mean it's a wise choice. Some people do really terrible things as a result of trauma they've experienced. But deep inside, most of us have got hurt kids inside or distressed kids inside of us that need love and attention. And when they get that love and attention, when they feel respected, doesn't mean you have to encourage temper tantrums, but you understand that that kid's scared or hurting inside. Most of us have got a scared or hurting kid inside that can come out under certain circumstances. When we hold love and respect for the fundamental human being's experience, we regain moral standing in the relationship. So food is one of those places where a lot of people are not eating in their own best interests. A lot of people are eating foods that are statistically correlated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease and Alzheimer's and diabetes and obesity and making them feel bad and increasing the risk of depression and anxiety while they're polluting the environment and depleting the topsoil and consuming our water like there's no tomorrow and, and fueling the destruction of the tropical rainforest and the extinction of species and fueling climate chaos. This is what's happening with the food choices so many people are making today. And it's easy to feel outraged and it's easy to want to shout from the rooftop, stop it, don't do it anymore. But here's the thing, folks. 
We've also got to love people. We've also got to honor the human beings who are making the best choices that they know how, often with difficult circumstances. Many people feeling like just getting enough calories to fill their belly is success. And if they can have a little bit of pleasure along the way, they want that. We want that for them. We want them to have pleasure. We want them to have success. We want them to have ease. We want them to enjoy their lives and enjoy their food, right? So aligning with that, honoring that, respecting that, respecting human sovereignty and human dignity and human needs. And then we go the next step and we say, oh my gosh, is there a way that they can better accomplish what they want? Is there a way that by learning, helping them be learners, helping them get curious, maybe possibly they could feel better. Maybe possibly they could have less pain. Maybe possibly they could have less fear, less suffering, less depression, less anxiety, better blood flow, less need for medications, less weight that they carry around, more ability to run and move and dance and love their lives. Maybe they care about the world too. Maybe if they really knew they could be part of the solution instead of feeling guilt tripped, maybe they'd want to. So we have the opportunity to get on the right side of people's souls, people's dignity, people's longings for their lives. That is the invitation. See, my son River needed to feel safe. He needed to feel accepted in his desire for security. When I joined him in his needs, in his desire, in his world, suddenly he was still there. He didn't feel threatened. I didn't drag it, him out of it. But we were together. We were connected. And I'll tell you, my son River doesn't chew on Barbie feet anymore. He hasn't done that for a long time. We have eye contact every day. He'll greet me at the end of a long work day, look in my eyes, give me a hug, tell me he loves me, ask me how my day was. These are all things that I never dreamed of 12 years ago. But it happens. He's still got his struggles. He's still got his challenges but he's working on it and we've got love and we've got connection and we've got a relationship. And that is so precious. So remember the importance of relationships. Remember the importance of love. And if you want to influence people, this is one of the most powerful things to hold. And also remember that maybe you know something, maybe you're learning something, that might, just might be a benefit to the people you love most. They may not want to listen to you today or tomorrow. There's the saying, you can lead a horse to water, you can't make it drink. You know, everyone's got their timing. They've got their journey. Some people may not ever change. Love them anyway. Love them anyway. And if you can, maybe you'll find openings to keep making offers keep making invitations, but honor their dignity and their sovereignty and their timing. They'll do it when they want to do it, if they want to do it. And you'll just keep being you. And hopefully part of you is the part that loves them, loves them enough to speak the truth, loves them enough to even have uncomfortable conversations sometimes, loves them enough to let them know you love them no matter what they eat. So this is what's at stake. This is what we're facing in our world today. And this is the opportunity of our times. George Bernard Shaw said something that I think is quite eloquent. He had a propensity for eloquence. He said, this is the true joy in life, to be used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one, to be a force of nature instead of a feverish clod of ailments and grievances complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. He said, I am a member of the community, and as a member, it is my privilege to do for it whatever I can before I die. Life is no brief candle to me, he said. It is more of a splendid torch, which I want to burn as brightly as possible before handing it on to future generations. So I want to thank you for burning your candle or your torch as brightly as you can. All the ways that you stand and work and love and live and dream for a brighter tomorrow. 
all the ways that you participate in large ways and small ways in contributing to making this world a, a brighter, more beautiful place for future generations. You know, it can look dark sometimes, but here's the thing to remember about darkness. A candle is most powerful in a dark room. Leadership sometimes means bucking the status quo. It means doing something different with your life than maybe the norm around you. And it doesn't just mean being an oddball. I think leadership means being adherent to your values. It means marching to the beat of your drummer. But here's the thing. When a lot of people do one thing and you do something different, you actually have more influence because you're changing things. You're showing another possibility like that candle in a dark room. And step by step, we're starting to shift culture. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I certainly have. In the last couple of decades, food is changing. And in some wonderful ways, we're starting to see more and more plant milks in grocery stores. When I was a kid, there wasn't even soy milk in supermarkets. Nowadays, there's soy, there's almond, there's oat, there's hemp, there's pea milk. That sounds a little funny, I know, but it's true. There's pea milk. Um, there's flax milk. Uh, there's rice milk, right? I think oat's the big one of the day. Maybe almond is number two. Soy is number three. But all of these are getting more and more popular and competing for market share. Meanwhile, cow milk consumption is going down, down, down. This has happened really fast. Uh, we're seeing plant meats of all kinds coming out. They may not be the healthiest, but my goodness, are they abundant and they do help people make transitions and see that something else is possible. We're, we're seeing uh, tofu. We're seeing plant-based foods showing up in grocery stores all over the place. Restaurants with vegetarian options or even vegetarian menus, as well as vegetarian restaurants popping up in more and more communities. Natural food stores in places you never would have found one before. And this is because of demand. Corporate America, the corporate food industry, is responding to demand. I've spent time talking with senior executives at Nestle and Coca-Cola, Unilever, many of the major, other major food brands. And I'll be honest with you, I can be really judgmental about some of these companies and their practices. When they're marketing junk food to kids, when they're making products that are devoid of nutrition, devoid of fiber, high in processed oils and sugars and animal products, and I know what that does to human health, I'm like, how do these people sleep at night? How do they live with themselves knowing that the more people eat their products, the more they're going to die, the more they're going to suffer, and the more ecosystems will be ravaged by the production of these products, packaged in plastic, with tastes that are designed to get people addicted. How do they live with themselves, right? But I've sat with these folks, and I'll tell you something. They don't stay up all night trying to figure out how to make kids get sick. They don't stay up all night trying to figure out how to ravage ecosystems. No, none of that. These folks are trying to make money for their shareholders. They are in a system where if they don't make money next quarter, their job's going to be gone. So they're trying to make money in a system in which the marketplace demands extraction of resources for the lowest possible price treatment of animals in any way necessary to secure the lowest possible price for their flesh, in which the marketplace demands packaging products, marketing products, and producing products that consumers will eat as much as possible of. What this means in effect is that they feel like prisoners to market forces beyond their control. And in some ways they are. I spoke with senior VP of Nestle. She said, I'll be honest with you, our products aren't exactly the healthiest. But we've chosen to make our focus making tasty and convenient food accessible and affordable to as many people as possible. Sounds almost like a social justice mission, doesn't it? I was like, well, yeah, but, but you're making those people sick. And she said, well, you've got a point, she said, but we've tried making healthier options with less sugar, less sodium, less oil, less animal products. 
and they often don't sell as well. We've tried really hard to make healthier options, but it's tough. And I realized then, you know, if every company that does the right thing goes out of business, we're in big trouble. So we've got to find ways to make the marketplace evolve. The way I look at it, Food 1.0 is about survival. If you get enough calories to fill your belly, that's success. Food 2.0 is governed by commerce. It's about the buying and selling of goods, and it's bought us lots and lots of options in the marketplace. Unfortunately, it has no moral compass, and it's killing us and killing our planet, which is why I'm calling for Food 3.0, where the central organizing principle is health, health for our bodies and health for our world. And I believe there are healthy profits in Food 3.0. It's just they come from healthy food. So here's the thing, though. We as consumers, every bite we take is shifting systems and creating demand in the marketplace so that companies like Nestle start to say, oh my gosh, there is a demand for plant-based options. And they're saying that. The CEO of Nestle at a recent conference that I was attending on food security said that he believes that a third of the protein market will be plant-based within the next 10 to 15 years. So Nestle is acting accordingly. They're investing heavily in plant meats and plant-based food options. Tyson Foods, the largest chicken company in America, is a major investor in Beyond Meat and now is making their own meat or you know plant meat products. The writing's on the wall, folks. These companies can see the future. They know that a plant-based future is the only way to successfully feed humanity to address climate change. And quite frankly, it could help to stem the tide of obesity and chronic disease. So they're starting to get with the program because consumers are demanding it. Burger King didn't start offering the BK veggie in all their restaurants because they had an epiphany and said, oh my gosh, folks, we're destroying the rainforest. We better save the world. No, they did it because they could make money at it. That's what they're accountable to. So we have power. And as we start to shift marketplace forces, we're shifting the foods that are available, which in turn makes it easier for more people to do the right thing. When I was a kid, weirdos like my family eating healthy food had to work really hard to do it because there wasn't whole grain bread in grocery stores. There wasn't soy milk. There wasn't even tofu. But now there's so many options, so many resources, the plant cheeses, the plant milks, the plant meats. And now we're learning that, oh my gosh, we can also make our own and make healthier options, bean burgers and homemade nut milks and homemade soy milks. And it's getting easier to do that. And there's gadgets and tools that make it easier still. And the big picture here is that we are shifting the course of food history together. And we're helping turn the tide. And nothing less than our lives and the lives of our children and the future generations is on the line today. So you and I have immense power. Every dollar we spend, every bite we take is kind of like a vote. You're voting for the health you want, and you're voting for the world you want. So let's make it count. Thank you so much. And now I'd love to take some time.